Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm pleased to officially welcome you to the Bretton Woods Committee's 2021 annual meeting. We have a full week of content planned, and we look forward to your participation in what we hope will be productive and engaging conversations throughout the week. This year's annual meeting theme is focused on securing a balanced and sustainable global recovery to COVID-19. While some countries such as the United States and China are beginning to see light at the end of the pandemic tunnel, many emerging markets and developing countries face a much less certain and much longer <clears throat> to recovery. Throughout the annual meeting this week, we will be discussing how we can accelerate the recovery for all countries by ensuring equitable vaccine access, addressing burdensome sovereign debt buildup, and leveraging new economic opportunities such as green investments. We are kicking off our annual meeting today with a discussion on sovereign debt, and I am very proud and pleased to announce that this is the official launch of the Bretton Woods Committee's new special project on sovereign debt. And we are joined today mm -hmm. by many members of our new sovereign debt working group who will be releasing their introductory report titled Sovereign Debt, a Critical Challenge. You'll be able to find the report located on our website, so we encourage you to go there and to download a copy. But the working group members will be discussing its contents today and also their activities over the next 12 to 18 months. So I just want to thank our working group for joining us today and for all of your efforts in, uh, in releasing this introductory report. We very much look forward to hearing from you today. Um, so before I turn it over to them, just a couple of notes. I first want to thank our annual meeting sponsors, mm -hmm. SICPA Holdings, Morgan Stanley, and Standard Chartered. Uh, without their generous support, our annual meeting would not be possible, so we thank you very much. Also, we will reserve some time for audience questions after the panelists uh, give their comments. So we ask that if you have questions, that you please submit them by typing them into the Q&A function of the, in the Zoom toolbar or through the chat box. We'll collect these throughout, and then we will call on individuals when it's time for Q&A so that you can pose your questions directly to the speakers. Um, and with that, I will now briefly introduce our speakers today. Uh, first, co-chairing this new Sovereign Debt Working Group is Bill Rhodes. And uh, Bill really needs no introduction to the Sovereign Debt community, as many of you know him from his long and distinguished career at Citibank, uh, and where his leadership was really instrumental in addressing the Latin American debt crisis. So Bill, we're so fortunate to have your experience and expertise leading this new initiative, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, alongside Bill, serving as co-chair, is John Lipsky, and John is uh, currently a distinguished scholar and senior fellow at Johns Hopkins SICE. Previously, John was the first deputy managing director at the IMF, where he helped guide the fund's response to the European debt crisis. Uh, so John and Bill could think of no better team to lead this effort. Very much appreciate your leadership and uh, for the Sovereign Debt Working Group, but also on BWC's executive committee and board of directors. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, let me turn now to a few of the other members of the working group. We have with us Mark Walker, who is a senior managing director at Guggenheim Securities. And Mark has really spent his career advising on sovereign debt matters. And I particularly want to thank Mark for his leadership and all of his effort in helping us draft and release this first introductory report. We also have Joaquin Levy, who is director for economic strategy and market relations at Banco Safra. Previously, Joaquim served as a CFO of the World Bank Group and also as finance minister in Brazil. Susan Siegel is the president and CEO of the America Society, Council of the Americas. She has extensive experience working in Latin America, including during the Latin American debt crisis. And finally, Jose Vinales is group chairman of Standard Chartered. And previously, Jose was the financial counselor at the IMF and also a deputy governor at the Bank of Spain. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for committing your time and energy to the working group. The working group's expertise truly is unparalleled. Um, so I appreciate your commitment to this new initiative. And with that, I will turn it over to John Lipsky to get us started today. John? Thank you, Emily. And thank you very much for your leadership as executive director of the Bretton Woods Committee and to your uh, deputy, Greg Bronstein, who uh, two of you have been instrumental in helping guide the organization of the, of the Bretton Woods Committee's new efforts and particularly of the Sovereign Debt Working Group. And as Emily has just uh, described and hopefully you're aware, today we're releasing this introductory <laughs> essay that's laying out the specific of specifics of the work plan for, that is going to guide the, the working group uh, over the next 18 months. And uh, as you all know and understand as members, the Bretton Woods Committee 
as activities are intended to support, provide important support to international cooperation on economic and financial issues. And the formation of the Sovereign Debt Working Group was motivated by several well-known factors. First, uh, and factors that predated, as uh, some that predated the, uh, the COVID crisis, the pandemic, and the uh, global economic downturn that it engendered. First, even before COVID, uh, debt levels internationally were reaching re record highs. But even beyond that, specifically looking at sovereign debt issues, two characteristics stood out. One, that sovereign balance sheets have become much more complex over the last few years. It's not just a matter of traditional <clears throat> bonds and loans, but much more, much more uh, sophisticated and complex uh, forms of borrowing. But secondly, creditors have become much more diverse, not just in source countries, not just at specific institutions, but even within uh, countries, within institutions and between them. So the uh, terrain has become but higher stakes and more difficult. Now, even before the COVID challenge, it's been obvious that there's been a need to strengthen the debt resolution process through new approaches, new practices, and new tools. And even with the somewhat improved global outlook that, for example, the IMF is going to release today in their update of the World Economic Outlook, it's been very clear that if there are still significant risks, if not certainties of debt distress that is coming among emerging, some emerging market and developing countries. Just in the past week, you've heard warnings to this effect from the managing director of the IMF, from the president of the World Bank, from the secretary general of the United Nations uh, and from other leaders from both the private and public sectors. Another motivating factor, the initiatives undertaken so far in this regard by the international community, such as the sovereign debt, um, uh, the SDDI, to uh, uh, postpone payment of sovereign debt by the poorest countries. The prospect this week that there will be a, uh, an important agreement on a new allocation of SDRs. The development and promotion by the Group of 20 of Common Framework for Debt, we all can see, is, are all helpful but don't represent an answer to the problems that we've described. The Bretton Woods Committee decided that we need specific to try to develop specific actionable proposals and methods for building a consensus around the adoption of these new proposals. So we formed this, the Sovereign Debt Working Group among including a diverse group of experts. Some you see here today as a member of this panel that we're very uh, honored and, plus, and pleased to have with us. And today, the panel is going to introduce the four major uh, focus areas of the, uh, of the working group. Uh, we will be producing, in, in addition to the introductory uh, uh, publication or essay published today, four additional special topics, stu studies, and a concluding document. And let me just briefly mention mm. the members of the working group who are not with the panel today, but who have been providing very important input into the development of our work so far. Uh, Richard Cooper, Clary Gottlieb has been working <clears throat> closely with uh, uh, Mark Walker in developing the, the text that was published today. In addition, Terry Checky, formerly Executive Vice President of New York Fed, Bill Dudley, who's the chairman of the Bretton Woods Committee, formerly uh, uh, also president of the New York Fed, Gail Kelly from Australia, former CEO of Westpac, uh, Maria Ramos, who's the, the chief uh, <clears throat> chair, sorry, of the Anglo Gold Ashanti, formerly director general of the South African uh, uh, Treasury. And they also, all these members, I wanna extend my thanks for <clears throat> their contribution so far and uh, look forward to working with them. And now I'll turn this over to my very distinguished co-chair and uh, certainly one of the uh, fonts of ideas and uh, impetus for progress in this area uh, for so many years, Bill Rhodes. Bill, over to you. Thank you very much uh, for your excellent uh, introduction, John, and uh, also for mentioning the various members of, uh, of the committee. Uh, as John said, this is a critical time, a critical report 
I, I would say before I ask Mark Walker to start off with, I think what we're seeing in the markets today is a tremendous amount of money uh, that's been pressed in both on the fiscal and the monetary side, not only in the United States, but all over Europe uh, in Asia too, whether it be China or Japan. Uh, and every time we've seen this over time to resolve this problem of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and its fallout on the world economy, we eventually see rising interest rates. And every time we see rising interest rates, uh, it hits hardest in the emerging markets, particularly the poorer countries. So we are facing not only the fallout from COVID, but the perspective over the next uh, year or two of rising interest rates worldwide, which will just exacerbate the situation uh, that we're seeing now, because every time we see uh, a period of rising interest rates, the emerging markets are the ones uh, that feel the brunt of it. Having said that, I will now turn to Mark Walker, who was a pen along with Rich Cooper on our work to give a brief overview. And then I will go on to our distinguished panelist, uh, Susan Siegel, uh, who is chairman uh, uh, and uh, president of the Council of the Americas, uh, Jose Vinales, who is the uh, chairman of Standard Chartered Bank uh, and formerly uh, deputy governor of the People's Bank of Spain uh, and a very senior uh, member of the IMF uh, staff when he was there. And in course, uh, Joaquin Levy, former finance minister of Brazil uh, and also CFO uh, of the World Bank where he did uh, tremendous work with us at uh, Bretton Woods during his whole period there. So Mark, I turn it over to you and thank you for the work you and Rich have done on this. Thank, thank you, Bill, and thank you, John, for the introduction. John and Bill have given you a bit of the background to the project that the working group uh, is addressing. It's important to recognize that although the pandemic has exacerbated the fiscal and economic problems of many developing countries, <clears throat> a lot of the uh, urgency for reform, as John explained, goes well beyond the pandemic and has to do with the change of the, of the landscape in which sovereign debt uh, issues need to be uh, focused on and resolved today. And there is a, and we saw that to a degree in uh, recent restructurings in Argentina and Ecuador, the ongoing discussions in Zambia, all of which uh, are designed to face problems that arose before and are quite independent of the, of the pandemic itself. Uh, and we've seen as, uh, as John has, has indicated in his little survey of what we've done, what has been happening, that the official sector as well as the private sector is focusing uh, heavily on how to address some of these problems. There have been many good ideas in IMF staff papers and other papers published by academics and other, other market participants as to how to try to improve the mechanics and the market practices that are uh, employed to deal with sovereign debt crises. But most of them focus at a rather high level of generalization uh, and leave for others the effort to try to take these suggestions and convert them into practical, actionable uh, ideas that can actually be employed in trying to deal with these crises. And the, so the effort of, the, of this sovereign debt working group is to explore in detail uh, as John said, four particular areas uh, that we believe are uh, central to the question of how to improve sovereign debt. We're going to look over the 12 to 18 months at various approaches that can be implemented in order to begin a process that will lead, we hope, to consensus as to specific reforms. We're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of various potential reform we will explore new and innovative ideas, and we'll also look at things that have worked outside the context of sovereign finance and the private sector uh, 
uh, and which may be good models or good signposts as to what to do to try to deal with some of the problems that we're facing. This paper is an introductory paper. Uh, it lays out the objectives of the committee. And as I said, focuses on four issues, which I'll briefly uh, identify. The first is transparency, which really means translation and, or disclosure of the liabilities of sovereign borrowers and also how those liabilities are treated in terms of uh, the arrangements, uh, arrangements arrived at between creditors and debtors. We will look at the question of how you uh, provide incentives for more transparency, uh, what kinds of uh, lack of transparency or <clears throat> to disclose in certain areas may be justified, uh, how to encourage people to, uh, to be more transparent, and indeed what the consequences might be or should be for failure to disclose. It's very hard to imagine a process that will enlist the participation of many creditors and create a sense of fairness unless underlying all of that is disclosure of what a country owes or doesn't owe. And it's important to recognize that the issues here are not simply questions of particular countries or particular uh, uh, creditors wanting to just failing to disclose. It also involves the private sector as well. Uh, and I just was reminded of that when I was uh, interviewed by a reporter from Reuters the other day, sorry, Bloomberg the other day, who said he was trying to get his hands on a uh, Paris, on the terms of a Paris Club agreement with Argentina, <coughs> and he couldn't get it because the Paris Club won't release it and Argentina won't release it. The mm. second topic we will address is participation of the private sector, both in debt relief, liquidity <coughs> support, uh, and equally important, providing flows of funds over the future. That's a sensitive subject. I think there are clearly misperceptions both on the side of the official sector and on the side of the private sector. Uh, I think there is goodwill for the most part on both sides, but trying to find a way to uh, encourage the private sector, which has become more and more important as a source of funding and support uh, to work cooperatively with the, with the public sector to the benefit of both, as well as the debtor countries is a challenge that we will, we will address. The third item is equitable treatment of creditors or burden sharing. Uh, this, is an item, this is an issue that has become all the more important and difficult because as John said in his introductory remarks, the universe of creditors has become much more diverse and correspondingly, the universe of liabilities has become more diverse. It's not just bonds or bank loans, it's commercial claims, it's arbitration uh, awards, it's judgments, it's derivatives, it's virtually any kind of obligation that you could imagine. And the financial sector has always been creative and consequently the, the range of financial obligations is also quite, uh, quite large. The, there are some issues actually that are created by the efforts of the official sector to deal with this, uh, which is part of the uh, rationale for the so-called common framework that the G20 countries and the Paris Club have put forward and which is in its, uh, in its early, early stages. And I'll just mention one. The common framework takes the position that although they are looking for uh, the private sector to provide relief that is, in their words, at least as great as that granted by the official sector. They do so in a very broad way saying, we're looking at the private sector as a whole. We're not focusing on any particular creditor. We're not focusing on any class of creditors. That I think will be seen by many as an invitation to say, fine, the private sector as a whole should participate, but that doesn't mean I need to, the rest of the private sector can do it. So that's a very interesting and difficult issue. The last thing that we're going to look at is a new form or not, not new, but a new to the sovereign uh, uh, financing landscape form of finance known with the somewhat 
uh, abstruse term is state contingent debt, which is another way of saying debt obligations that uh, are not, don't require payments on a fixed uh, schedule as to timing or amount, but which, uh, which link payment obligations to the debtor country's capacity to pay, not its willingness to pay, but its capacity to pay. Uh, obviously, an approach like that has advantages. It could mediate distress, it could avoid defaults, uh, but it also raises issue of mark issues of market acceptability because it's harder, much harder, obviously, for the market to value and judge instruments where the, there's no certainty the amount or timing of payments. Uh, and there's also, there also may be, and this is something the committee will focus on, the working group will focus on a role for joint private and official sector participation to find ways to use private sector money with official sector backing <coughs> Uh, to provide uh, financing of this of this nature. So let me stop there. That's a, an overview uh, of what the committee will be looking at. You will see that the paper goes into some detail as each of the subjects giving a hint as to kinds of things we were looking at, but the real meat of the work will be done uh, over the next 12 to 18 months as we examine mm -hmm. these areas in detail. Thank you, Bill. Thank you uh, very much, Mark, uh, as I said earlier, for the work, and John said also, for the work that you and Rich have done. But I also should mention that probably there's uh, no lawyer uh, in the business of working on sovereign debt that has the experience that uh, Mark has had over the years, whether it be at Cleary Gottlieb or where he is today uh, uh, at Guggenheim Partners. I'll now turn, turn it to my old friend and former colleague, Susan Siegel, who is president of the Ameri America Society, Council of the Americas. And uh, Susan, what I'd like you to talk about uh, is uh, the whole area of disclosure and transparency. And particularly, you, you might want to uh, talk about how you see this happening uh, in countries uh, that have gone through the debt restructuring recently, like Ecuador and Argentina, with regards uh, to Chinese participation. And of course, any other general comments uh, you might have. So I turn it over to you, Susan. Well, thank you very much, Bill. It's a pleasure to be on the panel today. Um, Bill has really been uh, my mentor for so many years. So thank you for everything. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about transparency. I think John and Mark have said so much about it already. As John alluded to the complexity of the liabilities um, and uh, Mark mentioned um, that as well. So for me, it's it's really simple. You can't solve the problem if you don't know what the problem is. And if you don't have transparency of all of the debt and all the liabilities, you don't know how on an equitable basis um, to reduce the debt or to restructure the debt. And given the complexity of the different countries that are creditors today, as well as the different kind of liabilities that exist today that Bill, during our time of restructuring never existed, um, there's no way that if everyone doesn't disclose what is out there that we can solve and help countries create a debt burden, which is sustainable and creates, in my opinion, <clears throat> equitable growth which is really um, this whole social aspect is something which we're seeing um, rise up, obviously, in the United States, but across the world um, for different countries. They can't just restructure debt without thinking about what is the long-term um, debt burden. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, disclosure is critical. And you mentioned China, and I think that's absolutely critical because China's willingness to be transparent. They, in many countries, are the largest creditor. They're one of the largest trading partners. And frankly, they are becoming the largest investor in many different countries. And so their willingness to disclose um, what is outstanding um, is going to be very, very important uh, for other creditors to feel that there is equitable treatment across the board. And you know, equitable treatment from the very earliest days 
of restructuring in the early 80s has always been the most critical, critical piece um, to being able to achieve um, a successful uh, debt restructuring. So, you know, countries need to be willing to disclose. Now, there are many ways that we can encourage um, better transparency. It can come from the rating agencies, as noted, I think, in the paper. It can come from the SEC. And I think that the SEC and other uh, similar agencies across the world need to be more engaged in disclosing the liabilities that exist and looking in a multi-dimensional way as to what a liability actually is. But this is going to need government leadership um, and um, leadership from the IMF and the multilateral development banks to actually get to full, dis full disclosure. And maybe it has to be part of the conditionality as well for the IMF across the board uh, in terms of what's outstanding. I'd also want to touch for one second with the private sector, because the private sector also has to be transparent. Um, and if they're not transparent, um, then all of these other pieces, they don't have the credibility to demand transparency um, from the other players. And, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, it has become a business for um, certain creditors, certain funds to buy up debt and at a huge discount and try to renegotiate and be the toughest people at the table um, with the different sovereigns. And so I think that also makes the situation much more complex. So um, I think that transparency as to discovering what the liabilities are in a clear fashion and also um, working with liabilities that we've never worked with before in terms of transparency is going to be critical to getting to where we need to get to uh, going forward. And with that, Bill, I will uh, just stop and um, cede any additional time I have to you. Thank you uh, very much, Susan, as always, for covering the subject very well and giving your perspective. Uh, having worked on debt restructurings during the Latin American debt crisis and where you sit now, <clears throat> seeing countries like uh, Argentina and Ecuador go through this process. So I'd like to turn it over to Jose, who, as I said before, has so much experience, both as deputy governor of the Bank of Spain, uh, also with one of the senior positions in the International Monetary Fund during various crises, but very importantly today, chairman of Standard Chartered Bank, which has, has such a big position both in Asia uh, and in Africa, uh, and particularly his experience in dealing uh, with China. Uh, we, we have to remember that, that China uh, is not only the largest uh, creditor nation in, uh, in many countries in Latin America, but throughout the emerging world. In fact, the Kiel Institute in Germany estimates that present outstandings are somewhere in the order of 730 to 750 billion dollars to the one belt one road projects that were instituted a number of years ago. So China today is the largest creditor nation to the emerging market, something that was not the case during any of the former debt crises we went through. So having said that, I turn it over to you, Jose. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. And um, uh, you know, Mark has already uh, given the, the broad contours of the of the report, and I can make uh, a few a few remarks now, um, uh, focusing on on private sector participation, which I think is a is a key uh, ingredient for effectively addressing uh, debt problems. As as it was mentioned before, we are now at a critical juncture. Uh, the COVID nineteen uh, has exacerbated debt problems in a number of emerging markets and particularly developing economies. And uh, as a whole, uh, that group has lost uh, more than twice the output that advanced economies have lost during the pandemic. So that is something which has compounded, uh, in many cases, pre-existing problems on the debt front. So the question is, is what, what, what needs to be done and what role the private sector can play. And I want to start with one point that to me is very important. We need to solve uh, the problem of today, which is a stock problem, 
that is debt restructurings in those countries which have sustainable debt, unsustainable debt, or which in the future will have unsustainable uh, uh, sovereign debt. Um, but at the same time, we need to do so in a way that solves uh, tomorrow's uh, flow uh, issue, which is making sure that we have sustained capital flows that help these countries growth and develop. So we need to make sure that both things are handled in the, in the right manner. And there, there is a need for both the private sector and the public sector to come in. And we have seen already a number of initiatives from the DSSI initiative uh, last year, which has been extended into, into this year. Um, the common framework agreed by the G20 and the Paris Club and all of the issues that both uh, Mark and, and Susan were, were referring to. Now, if we look at the role of the private sector so far in the crisis, and we look at the uh, debt service uh, suspension initi initiative, the DSSI, well, the role of the private sector hasn't, hasn't been much. And the question is why? And I think that there are a, a variety of causes, but I just want to signal a couple of them, which explains a little bit the, the rationale for why the private sector has not been more actively involved uh, in, those, in those cases. The most important one is that there's been a, a lack of demand on the part of the DSSI eligible countries to request uh, private sector participation. Uh, they have requested uh, official uh, bilateral uh, relief uh, in a number of cases, but the instances where they have gone on to request private sector participation uh, has been minimal. Why? I think two reasons. First, when the crisis was purely a liquidity crisis, which is what the DSSI was, uh, you know, um, was was envisaged, envisaged to, to to address. That liquidity crisis at one time was relieved by the fundamental actions that were taken by the advanced uh, economies, central banks, uh, by the Fed in particular, but also the European Central Bank and others. And that is something which relieved uh, market liquidity pressures and which allowed a number of those countries not to lose market access. And in a number of cases, uh, I think there was a fear of being downgraded by rating agencies um, that you know, led to little demand on the part of the, uh, of the sovereign uh, debtors. Uh, and that's something which, which, uh, which, which explains why there was little private sector participation. I think that even if those uh, actions would have been requested, there would have been issues with some private sector participants in terms of their fiduciary obligations, uh, legal norms and regulatory constraints, in some cases, uh, making things more complicated regarding participation. So that, that is an area that I think needs to, be, uh, needs, to be, needs to be addressed. I don't want to forget something which uh, the report that we are publishing today makes clear, which is that in two very salient cases of debt restructuring, uh, like uh, Argentina and Ecuador, uh, there has been private sector participation. At the end, issues have been worked out. They've been up and downs. It's not been an easy uh, process. I wouldn't say that everybody's happy, but the existence of enhanced CACs in, in, this, uh, you know, in, in these bond clauses um, and in, in the application of the Institute for International <laughs> Finance Principles for stable capital flows and fair debt restructurings, I think, that have been helpful in uh, making uh, those restructurings happening. But I think we shouldn't be complacent because we need to step up our game and fundamentally improve the uh, international architecture for debt restructuring, building from what we have now. And I think there are a few areas uh, which uh, are particularly important to me and which are also flagged in the report. One is the one that uh, Susan just mentioned, which has to do with transparency. And that is an absolutely quintessential condition to uh, allow for the involvement of the private sector. You need to know what you are discussing. You need to know where your money is gone and where other, money's, uh, other people's money is and what may be the consequences. And that transparency, which by the way is fundamental, not only for debt restructuring, but for allowing international capital markets to operate rightly as far as sovereign uh, debtors are concerned, that is not, not here 
again, I think is very fundamental that the debt transparency initiative of the IAF uh, continues to run its course and now with the endorsement of the OECD as a debt repository to, uh, as data repository to, to make this initiative uh, go through. The other thing is that CACs, uh, which are uh, embodied in, um, um, in bond contracts, wherever they are embodied, may not be sufficient in all cases. And again, the report makes a number of uh, proposals or, or discuss options that would be deepened in the future, uh, in future reports linked to this in order how to uh, improve on the pre-existing tax. <laughs> The third thing is that remember, CACs are only um, relevant for bonded debt. But how about commercial bank debt? There, there are no CACs there. Uh, uh, debt restructuring is much, much more complicated because of that. So again, we need to think of what may be uh, ideas that can be put in place mm -hmm. in order to facilitate commercial uh, bank restructurings. And last but not least, I think that we need innovative solutions. We need innovative solutions in terms of um, um, collaboration between the private sector and the uh, IFIs in order to make sure that they pull their comparative advantages to solve these problems. And I will just use an example. In terms of channeling uh, funds to developing economies, uh, private sector banks and, and other investors work with multilateral uh, organizations like the World Bank, for example, in the provision of uh, blended finance, something that Joaquin Levy knows very well. That is an area where both resources are pulled to solve a problem. And I think that we need to uh, think of innovative financing solutions so that the collaboration between the public sector and the private sector may align the incentives and have the sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, inclusive uh, debt restructurings that the world needs. Let me stop here, Bill. Jose, thank you very much. Just a couple of additional thoughts. One, uh, since uh, you are in a position as, as uh, chairman of Standard Chart, uh, you have to deal with the rating agencies. And of course you have this wide experience uh, with your uh, prior career. To say a few words about the rating agencies also since standard chart is so important in Africa uh, and you, you have to link it with what's going on there with their debt restructuring and uh, this whole question of disclosure vis-a-vis -vis China uh, on Zambia. So if you could comment on those two, I would most appreciate it. Well, uh, a couple of words on, on, on each of them. On the credit rating agencies, I mean, they do their job. Uh, they use their criteria, um, they, they, they rate uh, um, sovereigns in the way that they see fit. I think it's also very important to educate sovereigns on what rating agencies do, uh, on how they rate uh, bonds, and how they rate banks, what maybe triggers events and what not. So again, I think that engagement between uh, creditors, debtors, and credit rating agencies is very important in order to reach an adequate mutual understanding of things. We have seen in a number of African countries uh, in terms of debtors, some less than perfect understanding of the role of rating agencies in, in the process last year. So that's point number one. You mentioned Zambia. In Zambia, I think it's, it's a great test of the importance of uh, transparency and something which is preventing uh, conversations from advancing is making sure that all interested parties, including uh, the most important ones, uh, both from the official and the uh, bilateral side and the private sector side, bring in all the relevant information so that uh, there is as, as, as good knowledge as possible of what is the state of the sovereign balance sheet in that particular case. And generalizes from that, I mean, the multiplicity of debt instruments that uh, Mark was talking about, uh, we have a lot of contingent <coughs> debt. Uh, what is that? How big is it? Uh, how is this being back? A lot of these things in many cases beyond Zambia, we don't, you know, there is no enough clarity in the market. And this is something which is preventing further involvement from the private sector. So again, if I had to think of something which is first and foremost, is transparency and Zambia is a clear case exemplifying that. 
Thank you very much, Jose, for your very uh, excellent remarks. Now I'll turn it over to Joaquin Levy, uh, who's an old friend who is certainly uh, has experience uh, not only as finance minister of, of Brazil, but also senior positions at the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, and he's now uh, with the private sector. So I think you are in a unique position, Joaquin, to talk about uh, burden sharing between the various parties here in the sense of trying to resolve uh, the problems we're facing and will continue to face over the next couple of years in sovereign debt restructuring uh, and how the various sectors can work together in the sense of burden sharing. So I call on you uh, to do that. Thank you. Thank you. First, uh, thank you for uh, having us uh, here. And, uh, exciting work with uh, the committee. And um, uh, well, um, the burden share, of course, is the, the ultimate goal of what you're doing. It's a, con it's a condition, but it's also, I think, a, a goal. And a lot of what has been discussed before in terms of transparency and, uh, and uh, private sector participation uh, ends up into that. I, I'd say that, uh, of course, you have two pillars. First, how to bring everybody on board and then how to share uh, this burden. For that, of course, information is fundamental. There have been mechanisms to, uh, to bring uh, new participants. We know everything that the G20 and the Paris Club is, uh, are trying to do to uh, involve uh, large uh, creditors, especially uh, new creditors like, like China. Also, we, we know, and uh, uh, Vignal's just mentioned, that, of course, the CAC, the clauses have been extremely useful uh, to, to solve uh, uh, restructuring uh, situations, but they apply just uh, for bonds. There's one reason for that, of course, they, they try to, to uh, respond to the problem of coordination, which is more difficult for bondholders than uh, for, uh, say, banks, which usually are fewer uh, uh, on the room, in the room. But uh, it would be important to have similar uh, uh, clauses in, uh, for other instruments so that we facilitate this uh, communication um, um, among uh, different creditors. Also, I think um, um, there are lessons in relation to these clauses uh, because uh, um, there is some innovation how to treat very different a type of creditors. We saw in the case of Argentina, we have a very uh, two big uh, groups of creditors, and they have to use some imagination on how to uh, operate and uh, use in an unexpected way uh, some of the clauses and some of the language in, in their uh, <laughs> bonds to to reconcile the difference and try to be uh, to offer something that. Uh, would be felt to be equitable uh, between uh, the different classes of bondholders. Uh, there is one thing that uh, the, the paper we explore, actually there are many things that uh, the group will explore. One of course is the question of how the, we'll treat new money uh, in the case of a, a private investor. Of course, the, the official lenders provide the new money in the process of restructuring. This is all about uh, the, the IMF uh, loans in, in the process, but uh, there is no clear, let's say, framework to consider any, say, special status for new money in, in, uh, in uh, a restructuring of, of sovereigns. And this is, is important. Again, the case of Equator is a good example where they would like to have not only immediate access to the market, uh, without paying a very high price, uh, but also they need to fresh mon money uh, very quickly. I, I think at the beginning of our conversations, uh, it was mentioned that we are in a, now in a different world where interest rates are going up. And then one question would be to which extent this new environment uh, may complicate uh, one of the, the, the venues that have been uh, used uh, recently, which is uh, preserve the, the principle of the loans, but uh, achieve the debt reduction by reducing uh, interest mm -hmm. rates. In this new environment, this may become uh, more complicated uh, 
uh, to do. So I believe there, uh, uh, the, the initial paper already raised a number of very important issues. There are some that you have to explore because they've not been uh, really addressed in the past. And here I mentioned one uh, uh, final thought, which is uh, the scope in terms of sharing the burden of including uh, environment uh, or climate uh, related clauses when, uh, when we negotiate these. I think that uh, this might be part of contingent or conditionalities uh, for the renegotiation, but you be a way uh, to share uh, the burden. And I think there is appetite uh, in the private sector for that, <clears throat> all the letters that some asset manager uh, have uh, put forward and uh, they are very important players in this restructure, as well as with bilateral uh, official uh, creditors uh, for whom uh, this arrangement can help uh, to comply with some of their contributions, for instance, at uh, the, the Paris Accord by playing with uh, uh, their, their targets in terms of national uh, determined contributions. So I think it's, a, it's a, like a uh, Vinal said it's part of the innovation that we could consider in terms of finding uh, more engagement and a better way to, to share the burden in this complicated uh, renegotiation. Now, I have to make a disclaim, uh, uh, Bill, that uh, I didn't have a first-hand experience of renegotiations because, as you know, since the 80s, when you helped Brazil, after that, uh, Brazil never had, uh, fortunately, to go through any renegotiation. So, in a way, it's limited my, my experience when I was in government. Uh, and since the 90s, we didn't go through that. But this is very important to the Western Hemisphere, especially for the smaller, smaller economies, which, uh, I mean, are vulnerable for, uh, say, weather uh, events or for any other uh, reason, especially in the aftermath of COVID. So this is extremely important discussion for the whole continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joaquin. One of the things that you brought up, which I think is very, very interesting is how we can include so-called green finance and uh, this whole area of climate change within debt restructurings. And I wonder if you have any other thoughts on that because I know you feel very strongly about it. And of course, uh, today in Brazil, your native country, your home country, this is a major issue on climate and climate changes, which all sorts of forces within the government and outside the government are clashing. How would you envision maybe we could, uh, it, you know, we could include these in, in, our, in our debt restructuring arrangements going forward? Would you put an incentive uh, for those uh, either official or private sector creditors to get involved that they would get a special option if they agreed to something that included green finance and climate change? Yeah, I think uh, of course you, you could, uh, like you mentioned for the, the bilateral credit, we could have some sort of uh, say benefit that would accrue for, for uh, say the, the credit country. But in particular for the private sector, I think there's an appetite for instruments that are linked to uh, green uh, finance and uh, anything related to say either specific actions or results um, uh, would have, uh, uh, I think, appeal. In Brazil, we have uh, issued a number of bonds. Many companies have issued bonds where uh, you have say a kick-in uh, clause where if you uh, comply with certain goals, you have a, uh, 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 interest rate reduction and so on. So bringing this to the discussion could be a good way to provide relief uh, in, in a way that will be, uh, say, attractive to final investors. So for uh, it's an additional degree of freedom to, especially for large asset managers. I think your thoughts are, uh, are very important. And it's something I think we need to to work into some of these additional papers we're going into because there's no doubt that's the future and the pressure uh, with the climate change agreement, the change of administration here in the United States uh, with Biden wanting to get involved again in this, I think uh, will also be driving 
the IMF, the World Bank, and the regional development banks in this regard. And, and the bill, just one final thought, um, especially when these are linked to increase the resilience of the country, uh, that also makes a lot of economic sense. So improve the quality of the claim. There are things that are what is called mitigations, <clears throat> just reduce, um, let's say, emissions, but also uh, there's an important, uh, say, uh, um, strength, <clears throat> which is to increase the resilience of the country against uh, uh, the effects <clears throat> of climate change. And uh, linking this to some of the work, as Vignal mentioned, with the uh, multilateral. So you could have also a component of land uh, finance into that. I think it's something that uh, is workable. And uh, certainly I'll be glad to, to work uh, with the working group in exploring these possibilities. Well, we are gonna take you up on that. And I think it's a very interesting idea. Mark, I'd like to turn it back to you because you're the one who has the most experience with these clauses, which I think started uh, out with Mexico when you and I I, on representing the banks and you, the Mexican government, talked about value recovery, uh, tying it to the price of oil, and a, a number of other things have come in, hurricane bonds in the Caribbean and one thing or another. Uh, and uh, Mark, you might want to comment on that because you probably had more experience trying to put together those type of arrangements as to also as to how successful they are and are they realistic, realistic to carry on in the future. Sure, I'm happy to, Bill. I think up to now, the idea of linking payments by, <clears throat> excuse me, by countries to uh, external events, which are essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, proxies for capacity to pay, such as GDP, which figured in the uh, instruments issued by Argentina and by Ukraine, or oil, which figured in the instruments issued by Mexico and by uh, Venezuela, in a long, long before Mr. Chavez, uh, those were issued. Those were instruments that were issued as part of a restructuring <clears throat> to try to compensate bondholders for the impairment of their debt, for the, the portion of their claims that they had given up in the restructuring. The idea being that if the country's performance exceeded that which had been anticipated and which was the basis for the restructuring, then the bondholders would be able to recover uh, all or a portion of what they had given up. These clauses really fell into disfavor and haven't really been used since 2015 or 2016. Mm -hmm. And the reason I believe is that they, frankly, they were poorly designed from a market standpoint, either uh, they were intended certainly by the authors on the, on the debtor side to be promises which would never have to be fulfilled. That is to say, they were written in such a way that the expectation is that absent really <clears throat> fantastic performance, there wouldn't be any payment. And I confess to having tried to write instruments like that. Or the other way, and if you look at the value recovery instrument issued in the Ukraine restructuring, uh, it go, it errs from my perspective, or it, it, its bias is totally in the other way. And the recovery uh, in that case could vastly exceed the modest uh, haircut that was involved. So they, and, and, the, and they were not valued well. Uh, at the outset, the market gave them virtually no value. <clears throat> uh, and so many bondholders sold them right away. They got nothing. If they held on to them, they often sometimes got nothing, but sometimes got a lot. And because they were exceedingly difficult to value and because their value at the outset was virtually always close to zero, uh, the impetus to pursue that uh, didn't succeed. There's been a lot more thinking about how to create instruments of this sort. And I think there's an opportunity to uh, to come up with things that work uh, in a much better way in the sense of truly <clears throat> collecting capacity to pay. As part of the early uh, discussions between Puerto Rico and its bondholders, uh, the advisors to Puerto Rico put forward some ideas which uh, were much more uh, sophisticated, frankly, <clears throat> not put into practice for a variety of reasons, having 
nothing to do with the design of the instruments. I, the other thing is though, that when you talk of hurricane bonds and other things uh, uh, that are not restructuring related, it's a, it's a different picture. Here, the, the value recovery instruments were, were one-way ratchets. They yes. only went up. In, <clears throat> in good times, they paid more. In bad times, they just didn't pay anything. Uh, but the state contingent debt could be not just restructuring, which is the way the IMF staff, staff report looks at it, but also a way to provide fresh finance. And there, I think the opportunities are more interesting and payments can go up as well as down. Greece uh, uh, and the uh, um, European Stability Mechanism looked at, uh, and we advised them on that, looked at ways to tailor payments on Greece's massive debt to the official sector uh, in a way that was geared to GDP and would go up and down and, and, and allay the concerns about, uh, about the huge debt overhang they had. Uh, again, that was not really put into practice for other reasons, but so I think there are opportunities to, to make progress in that, in that regard, Bill. Thank you very much, Mark. We only have a few minutes left for the panel because we want to open it up for questions, which Emily will be managing. But Susan, do you have any final thoughts before we open it up to the audience? Um, yes, Bill, I do actually. I mean, I, I think that I come back again um, to transparency because you can't do any of this if creditors aren't transparent. And so, um, you know, for me, um, that really becomes this idea of how do you tackle burden sharing going forward. And, you know, we're, we're in a really docile environment right now. And interest rates are going to start to go up. And when interest rates start to go up, you're going to see, as you know, a number of creditor countries with challenges that they don't even know they will have in front of them. And therefore, from my perspective, we need to begin to think about what does that disclosure look like today, not what is that disclosure gonna look like once countries get into trouble. Because if you don't know what the actual um, liabilities are, and if countries, and countries also have to disclose what their liabilities are, um, and if you don't, uh, give at least the ability um, to do sensitivity studies at higher interest rates. And maybe that becomes part of the whole disclosure package of the SEC or the rating agencies. Um, then in fact, you're not going to know um, what the situation is of a country in advance of a problem. And I think we've got to, for the first time, we've really got to get out in front of the problem before the problem happens. I think that's a very good point because we always used to talk about two areas, crisis uh, management and crisis prevention. And you're making the point about crisis prevention, which is what we all ought to spend time on rather than getting uh, stuck at the end of the day on crisis management. Jose, any final thoughts before we open it up to the panel? No, perhaps coming back to the issue of um, of, of sustainability that was mentioned before, I think that there is a real opportunity to uh, bring in the sustainable development goals I mentioned into the financing of emerging markets and particularly developing economies, a, a, an issue that, that Joachim uh, talked about also beforehand. And again, I think that we need to build from the experience. Th there is already quite a lot being done um, in terms of uh, governments defining sustainable projects. And I think that there is a lot more to be done in this case for uh, on the part of developing economies, number one. Number two, um, uh, banks and other financial intermediaries working alongside with international financial institutions to uh, provide bankable projects <coughs> which are attractive to investors. And I think that that's something which could be scaled up quite significantly and be used on its own right to provide sustained funds to emerging markets and developing economies, and also to be used as a possibility for debt swaps 
for countries which are on the verge of unsustainable, unsustainability uh, problems. So I think that this requires, this is an area where I think that pulling together the, uh, the minds of the public sector, the IFIs and the private sector and, and scaling up, I think all the elements are there. Uh, and that's, that's something that I hope can be, uh, can be pushed forward in the, uh, in, the, in the near future, because I think we will make a, a, a huge difference. I think it's an excellent point. I feel uh, during the Latin American debt crisis and the Asian financial crisis uh, later on when I worked on Korea and other countries, I found that the uh, private sector and the international financial institutions, particularly uh, the IMF, uh, but also uh, the uh, World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank work closer together than I've seen more recently. And I think we ought to take a look and get back to that. Joaquin, any uh, final comments before uh, we open it up for questions? No, I just would uh, echo, well, first what uh, uh, Vinyar said is extremely important and provides a very good uh, framework for uh, advancing on, on this topic of sustainability. And also, I mean, echoing what Sudan uh, said about looking forward uh, and prevention, I think it would be interesting to see uh, what is the coverage that the current debt sustainability exercises of the, the IMF uh, uh, have uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, going to these new types of uh, liabilities that we discussed in the report. So we know that for the last 20 years, uh, every Article 4 has some exercise in terms of that sustainability. But maybe it'd be a good time to visit uh, how, much, uh, how much coverage uh, they have in relation to the other, uh, the new types of, uh, of instruments, which goes back to the question of, of transparency that is fundamental for bird sharing and et cetera. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, uh, I'm gonna turn this over now uh, to Emily to take questions, but I'd also like to thank uh, <clears throat> John Lipsky, uh, my co-chair on this, and he is also willing uh, and more than able to take uh, questions any of you may have. So you may have questions for any of us individually or for the panel in general. If it's for the panel in general, then I will call on various panel members. Uh, so I turn it over uh, uh, to you, Emily, to field and work out the question and answer period. Thank you, Bill. And thank you to all of our panelists and working group members for that uh, amazing overview of, our, of the introductory paper. Uh, we, we have a lot of work to do going forward, um, but we do have several questions. So I wanna get to these. Uh, and I think uh, uh, picking up on some of Joaquin's last comments on the issues of transparency and, and debt sustainability analysis, I would like to turn to Whitney Debevoise who has a question in this regard. Uh, Whitney, you should be unmuted. Would you please go ahead and pose your question? Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, this is Whitney Debo voice. Um, I think as everyone has noted, transparency is key. Um, but one area remains obscure, namely IMF debt sustainability analyses. Uh, the IMF has made a template available, but debt resolution is really case by case. And uh, DSAs remain a bit of a black box. Uh, can more be done to improve the transparency of DSAs? I think, uh, John, why don't you take that one and then see uh, if Jose has any comments or the other panelists. Yes, uh, Whitney, the, uh, of course, the IMF's uh, debt sustainability analysis is uh, uh, rooted in the uh, obvious need as an uh, elemental uh, part of uh, setting economic policy as well as dealing with problems of debt distress is to try to get a handle on how much debt is sustainable for a given country. Uh, obviously, it's critical, but when you think about that country by country, you would like to standardize as much as possible, or to use the Einsteinian phrase that I probably overuse, you want to make things explanations as simple as possible but not simpler. And there is, of course, the rub. Uh, 
the, the spirit of trying to make a DF, a debt sustainability analysis comparable across countries in a useful way to maintain equal burden sharing in a sense uh, is critical and central to the effort. And yet there's a limit to the amount of uh, uh, standardization and uh, inevitably uh, specifics to the case have to be taken into account. Let that, lest that be uh, interpreted as uh, a nice waffle, uh, I would say it's, uh, it, remains, it remains the guiding principle. And I believe the IMF is in the process of re-examining uh, its DSA process and hopefully will follow the, uh, uh, the ideas that you suggested. But let me uh, turn, turn to Jose who has had a hands-on experience in directing uh, this kind of analysis and uh, see what he has to add. Well, thank you. I, I, think, I think you handled it uh, very well. I really, I, I really have uh, nothing to, 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 uh, to add or subtract from, uh, from your answer. Maybe just um, one, one related point, uh, which is the engagement of the uh, <clears throat> private sector uh, with the IMF. Uh, and when is the right time and what are the right channels for that engagement in terms of uh, conveying the views of the private sector to the IMF when the IMF is in the process of uh, analyzing the debt sustainability of a particular country. There is sometimes the uh, perception on the part of the private sector that um, the official sector, the IFIs, uh, uh, basically define all the key parameters uh, in terms of the amounts which are left for the private sector to do in a debt restructuring without sufficient prior consultation. If that's the case, then I think that uh, one of the issues that the report is, is going to look at is if there are uh, pragmatic, practical and constructive opportunities for enhancing the engagement between the uh, IMF and the uh, private sector as an input to the debt sustainability analysis. And of course, the IMF should remain the master of, 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 of the game. And it is for the IMF to, to define uh, debt sustainability, which is a very complex uh, process, as, as you know very well. But the question of engagement and the provision of uh, private sector input, I think that's an area which is worth looking at without, you know, and I should uh, say eroding, eroding at all any of the responsibilities or functions of the IMF, which I think that they should remain as they are. Mm -hmm. And I just want to underscore the point that Jose has made here is, uh, is absolutely important and essential and was taken up in the, uh, the essay that we published today. And it's something we'll be trying to look at in an operational way. How can this cooperation uh, be, uh, be enhanced? And I think at the end of the day, that's the spirit in which Whitney's question was asked. It's important and we'll take, we'll take a close look. I think uh, one of the things, John, uh, you can start off tomorrow when you do your interview with the managing director with Kristalina. This might be one of the points you might bring up with her. <laughs> uh, so I turn it back to you, Emily. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Thanks, John and Jose. And thank you, Whitney, for that excellent question. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Ted Truman. Ted, you should be unmuted if you could unmute yourself and go ahead and pose your question. Yes, this is a very interesting discussion on an important uh, topic, which I appreciate. Uh, I am a little curious. We A year ago, we thought we were going to have a bunch of COVID-related crises, uh, debt restructurings. Uh, uh, my sense is that there have been very few that have been directly related to the COVID uh, crisis at this point. Uh, what, so two questions, what do you, uh, how do you explain that? Uh, how would you explain that? And, and, uh, and so, and then if you think it's gonna be a delayed process, uh, which in some sense was the case in a number of other crises, uh, are you really talking about three or four years in which this uh, debt related uh, restructurings unfold, which would I guess suggest that uh, the work you're doing or the continuing work you're doing uh, will become relevant even if it's not explicitly relevant today. Thank you. 
Thank you for the question, uh, Ted. With your years at the, uh, uh, at the, both at the uh, IMF, the Treasury, uh, and particularly with the Fed, uh, you worked on these issues for many, many years. I started working with you in the 1980s, and I think it's a, uh, it's a very important question. I, I think, unfortunately, it's going to be with us for a while, given that I see interest rates rising. Uh, but Mark, uh, you've seen so many of these. Would you like to comment on Ted's question and anybody else of the group uh, of the panel? But I, Mark? Uh, sure. Um, I also had the experience of working very closely with Ted over many, many years when Ted, principally at the Fed and later, later at the Treasury. Look, I think, I, I, I think that's right, Ted, I, in the sense that I think the expectations initially in the early part of the crisis when the problems that countries had were essentially liquidity problems, the expectation was that things would get much worse much more quickly. Uh, they didn't. I think that's in part due to the fact that although many think the liquidity support provided by the official sector was inadequate, it was nonetheless very substantial. Uh, DSSI was only about $5 billion, less than half of what was originally anticipated, but the fund through its uh, rapid uh, credit facility and rapid financing instrument provided a significant amount of resources as did uh, the World Bank and, and others. But there has been a significant buildup of debt uh, and countries had, as a consequence of the pandemic, uh, expenditures for health and social needs, which were not anticipated, accompanied by a significant reduction in revenues and economic activity. And I, if you look at the charting that uh, a number of uh, banks and others are doing of that, that focus on the debt sustainability of countries, I think there are signals that would indicate that the question of sustainability of debt, and I'm not talking about uh, sustainable finance in the ESG sense, but the more, but the economic sense, can you continue to pay? And the question of whether countries have beginning to have solvency rather than liquidity problems seems to be, uh, seems to be on the horizon that things will get worse. And I think it's in that spirit that we're trying to make sure that we can make an, a useful effort uh, in improving the mechanisms that will deal with these issues. Uh, Susan, do you have any additional comments to that? No, Bill. I think Mark uh, said it well. Okay. What about Jose? No, only only to add that uh, the point that Mark uh, made is very important. I think that the uh, you know when we were at the end of March, um, yeah. I think that we were all scared that this could be a bloodbath because of the uh, drying up of markets. And then the, in particular, the facilities that the Fed uh, put forward were incredibly important in easing market tensions and allowing market access to stay for, for, quite, a number of, for quite a number of sovereigns. Otherwise, I think we would have had really a, a, a catastrophic experience. Something that uh, also helped during the year for a number of commodity importers sorry, commodity exporters was the rebound, the increase in commodity prices. I think that this is also something that made a difference. And then going forward, the question is what kind of recovery are we going to have in the world? Uh, the increase in interest rates that uh, Bill was mentioning, I think is, is, is an issue. Uh, if, if this comes with higher global growth, which also benefits to emerging markets and developing economies, that, that's going to be important to make things more bearable. But if we were to have a K-shaped recovery, and, and, and we will hear from the IMF uh, later uh, 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 what, what the, what the uh, we of, updated we of forecasts are, if we were to have a, a K-shaped recovery where many of these developing economies don't, don't recover uh, significantly, then I think that higher interest rates and, and still low growth uh, is going to be is going to be problematic. So the future, I think, is going to be conditional on a number of things happening, and also on the measures that can be put in place to enhance the debt architecture. So if there are other instances of uh, sovereign debt crisis, uh, 
how well are they handled and, and what kind of impact do they have on other debtors which may have be uh, also on the, on the verge. Joaquin, do you have any additional comments to, to Ted's question? I think, uh, of course, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but uh, we see some elements that are reminiscent of the early 80s when uh, we had both uh, a huge acceleration of U.S. growth, the, the rebound of the economy, as well as a huge increase in the financing uh, demand with a huge, uh, greater, larger uh, deficit. And we knew, you know, how this played out with emerging uh, economy. So I think that his call of thinking two or three years ahead is uh, very timely. Well, no, Ted's seen, Ted seen this movie play out uh, with different sunk titles many times. Susan? Bill, I actually do have a comment based on um, what the, the subsequent comments. Uh, you know, I think we cannot underestimate the populism and the elections that are going on and the demands within the countries not just for growth, but for equitable growth and the cost. I mean, the cost of the pandemic is just beginning to be felt in countries, you know, around education and around other social um, issues that are going to be required to bring these countries back to the right kind of growth. So, um, you know, I think that we're going to have to begin to think in those terms as well. We've always just been able to think about what does growth mean? But I think that there is no political room in certain countries um, for just having growth. It's gonna have to be growth that is much wider and deeper than they've had to worry before because the populist backlash in some of the elections um, is going to be really harsh. I think you're very correct and we're starting to see that in Latin America, that's yes, for sure. John, do you have a final point you'd like to make on this before we turn it back to Emily for questions? Just quickly, uh, the, the risks of trouble down the road are absolutely obvious. That uh, we can think about two uh, popular uh, admonitions about policymaking. One, that we should cross the river by feeling the stones. <laughs> And another is plan beats no plan. <laughs> they sound like they're uh, in opposite directions, but what they're telling us is be pragmatic and think ahead. And that's what we need to do. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I'm glad you uh, used our famous quote about crossing the river by feeling the stones uh, used so well by Deng Xiaoping many times. Uh, Emily? Uh, yeah, thanks, John and Bill. We're, that's certainly a, an applicable quote for a lot of what the Bretton Woods Committee is doing at the moment. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Carlos Carpi, who has a, a couple of questions on the state contingent instruments. Uh, Carlos, you want to go ahead? Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great event. Uh, thank you very much for the thought leadership of the, the Bretton Woods Committee. Um, so my question is on uh, the role of state capacity and tackling this added complexity of having these various agendas be brought into the management of sovereign debt. I was, uh, you know, my understanding, for example, with the GDP warrants and the Argentinian case took years, even, uh, even more than a year to, to get even the coupons to be activated once the GDP level was met. Uh, could the panel comment about the role of the uh, sovereign debt managers uh, within governments as we try to change the, the, the practices on uh, how to uh, think about a sovereign debt administration um, and these uh, new instruments? Thank you very much. Well, any one of our panelists could answer this, but I'm going to ask you, Joaquin, since you were Minister of Finance and uh, had senior positions about the World Bank and the IDB at the IDB going through various crises, uh, you know, with that uh, in, in various instances. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You're muted, Joaquin. I muted. Um, if, I, if I understood, I mean, the, the diversity of, uh, of uh, uh, creditors, um, of course, adds complexity to, to the discussion. As you mentioned, uh, we, we saw this in the case of uh, Argentina recently, but uh, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, something that uh, um, 
it's, uh, it's not addressable. Um, if, uh, I mean, if the country, I think what makes a big difference is uh, what are the objectives of the country? And uh, if uh, what they are trying to achieve is part of a long-term uh, strategy, I, I think that uh, these uh, differences in, in, in the type of uh, coupons or whatever um, are, are surmountable. Um, so, uh, the, like I said, I don't have a direct experience with, with in Brazil, but uh, when I look at the, at the World Bank, uh, we, uh, and I would say also experience with the IMF, the big difference is really the approach that the, the country is taking when addressing these issues. If it's something that's purely uh, transactional or is something really looking at uh, uh, medium or long-term uh, growth strategies. Susan, do you have any comment on that since you follow Argentina so closely and what's going on in Latin America? We keep having Argentina brought up for, as an example, both for good and for, for not so good. I mean, Argentina, I mean, the debt restructuring had huge challenges. Um, I mean, and it, I mean, it still has a challenge in terms of, you know, getting an IMF program and, and finalizing it. And it's a really great example where, you know, the fund is the largest creditor to Argentina right now. Um, but they had a huge problem, um, you know, restructuring the debt. Um, for some of the very reasons that I discussed, you had different creditors that had different interests, and it was very, very challenging um, to unify the interests into one negotiation uh, with one out output. And again, I think there was not transparency at all different, all different levels. Um, and so, um, you know, there was finally a debt restructuring and there's still pending an IMF program. Uh, Mark? Uh, yeah, the, I think that if I understood Carlos's question, it was focused more on the capacity of the debt managers to actually implement the transaction. Let, let me address it in two ways. I think, I don't think that the, that the GDP features of the, of the, <coughs> excuse me, the value recovery rights <coughs> that Argentina issued was a particular challenge to the capacity from an intellectual or managerial standpoint of, of people, I think, and I'm not that familiar with the delays, but I, I, I think my guess is it was more a question of willingness and political objectives. That said, I think it is true that for many countries, uh, there is a lack of experience, which is good in a way, a lack of experience dealing with debt restructuring, dealing with uh, what is, as a general matter, a quite complex uh, uh, subject and one where there's a lot of market practice. And if you don't know it, you don't know it. And it's not just a question of trying to figure it out. Uh, and that is a challenge for many countries. Uh, I think the design of state contingent instruments, which has to be improved, and I think can and will be improved, does require particular talent. Uh, and, and again, no doubt there is a, many countries will have a lack of experience, but on the other hand, the private sector has experience, the official sector has experience, <clears throat> or advisors who have experience, so I think that can be that can be overcome, but I, I think the challenge is there. But I think there are we always have to try to distinguish between questions of capacity and questions of political willingness, and the, the distinction is not always easy to grasp. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's pass it back to you, Emily, because we still have time, maybe for one or two questions, at yeah, least one more. I think we have time for one more question. We're going to go to Takatoshi Ito. Um, Takatoshi, okay. if you would please go ahead and pose your question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I have two questions. One is that Jose, um, hello Jose, uh, mentioned that um, uh, CACs uh, may have a limit. And uh, I recall that uh, there was, you know, holdout problem and whether that was non-CACs or CACs, I don't know, but the is the current version of CACs uh, holdout proof 
And could a hedge fund still uh, you know, buy the distressed bonds and successfully sue in the US courts? That's first question. Second question is that many of the, uh, China has been mentioned many times and uh, many of the Chinese credits um, are in the form of ODA, uh, project finance infrastructure with a long uh, repayment uh, period with uh, a relatively high interest rate, I understand. So are they covered under the common framework? Are they treated the same with the government bond issues that are held by portfolio investors? Those are two questions, thank you. Well, I think they're both very key questions. Uh, since it was directed initially at you, Jose, I'd, I'd ask you to, to pick up on them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe, maybe on, the, uh, on these questions, I'll say something, but I think it might be good also for Mark to, to, to chip in. Um, on, the, on the issue of uh, China, I think that the key, it, it's complicated because as, as you mentioned, Taka, uh, many, of, uh, many of this lending uh, has been tied to specific projects. And then the question is uh, who is providing the lending and whether the lending is classified as uh, official uh, bi bilateral official lending on the part of China, and that happens now with the Exim Bank, or whether it is uh, classified as as commercial as commercial lending. So it's 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 very it's it's complex. It's complicated. Um, as you know, the um, China has endorsed the uh, common framework, um, but so far only the Exim Bank is recognized in terms of the official uh, bilateral lending. So it's, 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 it's all very, um, it's, it's not, not clear yet, but each of those instances are solved uh, so far independently. And, uh, and, and, and we have uh, a multiplicity of uh, cases, particularly in Africa, where there are many of these project finance lending uh, in place and each of them going at different speeds. So I think that we have a mosaic of uh, circumstances, uh, all of them except for the ex in bank uh, lending outside of the common uh, on the common framework. On the on the limits of of, of CACs, um, I mean this is something which the report is going to go uh, into uh, uh, more deeply uh, in the subsequent uh, annex reports that we're going to be uh, writing. Um, th there are a number of uh, uh, things that I would say. One that when we talk about CACs and the uh, ability of CACs, it is something that has been uh, helpful, particularly the last generation of enhanced CACs, but it's not been sufficient in, 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 in many cases. And for a bank, commercial bank debt, that, that is something which doesn't exist. So that's an area which is uh, fundamental to improve. And when you get the courts involved, it's, it's something which, uh, which makes things very, uh, 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 very, very complicated. But beyond that, Mark, who's the expert on CACs, maybe, maybe you can say something, something else. Sure. Uh, before I turn it over to you, Mark, I, I think we should just make our uh, audience uh, understand, I think most of them probably do. Uh, China is not a member of the Paris Club. It is an observer, and it's been a very sensitive issue uh, with them. Uh, also, uh, as Jose was saying, uh, they don't recognize the China Development Bank, which, along with the China XM, uh, provide all of the financing or almost all of it under uh, One Belt, One Road, which is the largest particular uh, creditor in the emerging markets. Uh, in, a, in a recent uh, meeting, I had virtually, obviously, with State Councilor uh, Yang and member of the Pol Politburo, he reemphasized that that's their stance for the moment. We shall see if that changes uh, during these meeting, these upcoming meetings where the framework is being discussed. Uh, but Mark, why don't you pitch in here now? Sure, I'll, I'll be brief since I know we're at the end of our time. I think that the answer to the first question is no, CACs are not holdout proof. Uh, I doubt anything is holdout proof, but the reason is pretty simple. Uh, the basic framework of a CAC is that you need a supermajority, 75% uh, in many cases, in order to change the fundamental payment terms. If a country is in deep distress and its bonds are trading at a 
significant discount, it may not be that difficult for one or more creditors acting in concert to acquire <coughs> a blocking position, more than say 25%, which would stop the, op the operation of tax. Similarly, although there are so-called um, aggregated CACs, which can operate across uh, more series of bonds and so that the, the vote, uh, the overall vote could overwhelm, if you will, the negative vote of a particular series. There are problems, we don't have time to get into them now, but there are issues about using that technique uh, that make it often impractical. And in fact, in Argentina, the ag no, no effort was made to try to restructure using aggregated CACs because that, that Formulation in the in the ICMA in the ICMA model uh, would not accommodate the terms of the restructuring that uh, Argentina was putting forward. Your point about China and the ODA is a good point, and it's not it's not limited actually to the question of whether China whether whether China Development Bank is treated as official or commercial, because the and, and Zambia is a good example. On the one hand, you have bonds issued by the government unsecured general purpose bonds for government purposes, uh, which with a bullet payment. And then you have very substantial financing to Zesco, which is the Zambian state-owned utility uh, in, in a project finance format. And even if it's, even if you, if everybody concedes that that financing is commercial, of course, the common framework still suggests that the private sector should grant relief at least as great as that of the official sector. So how do you compare relief uh, due on respect of a 20 year bond or a 10 year bond with relief on uh, financing to a state owned enterprise that actually generates revenue uh, and is in the form of a power purchase agreement or is the form of some other credit. It's not easy to figure out what comparable treatment is. And that's in fact, one of the subjects which our uh, working group is, is intends to address. Thank you. I think uh, I will turn it over to uh, my colleague and co-chair to final words, but I would just remind people uh, to quote Winston Churchill, we are at the beginning of the beginning here and the heart of the matter uh, will be the four subsequent reports we're gonna turn out. This is just an introductory sort of a teaser trailer uh, to give you an idea of what we're gonna work on. Uh, so John, why don't you close this out? Thanks, Bill, and thanks to you uh, for your work in organizing this entire effort, not just this panel. And thank you very much to the panelists for their participation uh, and their excellent commentary, but also for their ongoing uh, participation in the working group. And uh, I, in closing, uh, I think it suffice it to say on my part, uh, if this were easy, it would have been done already. It's very hard, but it's also obviously very important to, to uh, make significant improvements in this area of debt resolution. And what we don't need is more high level admonitions to do better, but ac actionable proposals that we can try to start to build a consensus around implementing. That's the goal of this committee, of the, of the working group and of the Bretton Woods Committee. I reiterate, we all recognize this isn't easy. It's gonna be hard, but we look forward to not just the work of the working group, of the, the Bretton Woods Committee's board, the uh, advisory council, but the broad membership as well in providing uh, input suggestions. And we look forward to an ongoing dialogue as we work through this area over the coming year to year and a half. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Emily, I turn it over to you to close us out. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bill. Thank you to all of the working group members and our panelists today. There, there was so much interest in this topic. We had so many questions that we did not have time to get to. So I will just reiterate what John just suggested. Please do send us your questions and comments. The working group wants to hear them and they do want to address them as they work on their subsequent papers. Um, so a reminder that you can find the introductory paper on our website at brettonwoods.org. So please go there to download a copy of it. 
And with that, I'll just once again say thank you to the panelists and remind all of our audience in attendance to please join us this afternoon at 2 p.m. for our conversation with World Bank President David Malpass. Bill Rose will be talking to President Malpass and will be continuing this conversation on sovereign debt among other, pro uh, among other topics. So join us at two o'clock today. Um, and thank you once again, everyone, for this fantastic session. Bye-bye.